On today's Locked On Senators, it's a conversation we've had far too often. Shane Pinto's contract. But at what point does it become a legitimate concern? Probably somewhere around the draft, Ross, which is where we focus as we continue our 2024 NHL draft prospect profiles with three forwards that put up big points. We'll get into all that and more on today's edition of the Locked On Senators Podcast. It's your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson. I'm Tim Stützler, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome inside episode 1056 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Piller up in the Blue Mountains, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. You can also follow the show on social media at Send Central on Twitter, LockedOn.Senators on Instagram. You can find the show wherever you get podcasts, including on YouTube. Today is Wednesday, May 29th, and Pilsy, what a vibe that new intro is. Shout out to Matun Zelikovic for writing up a little jam sesh for us. It is exceeding my expectations, and they were pretty high. Yeah, I mean, it's the perfect combination of uh, funky and smooth, and it gets the vibe going. So, Ross, you know we're going to have a discussion about Shane Pinto's contract that is just going to be upbeat, positive, and as smooth as that new intro. Guys, let us know below in the comments if you guys like that new intro. We spent a lot of time trying to find the one that worked best, and uh, I think we nailed it. I'm so disgusted by how you handed that off to the Shane Pinto conversation, though, because it's not that. And Shane Pinto is a vibes guy. We should have released this new intro on the day that Shane Pinto got his new contract. I bet you Shane would like that song. Frank, let us know. But honestly, (laughs) when can we worry about this contract? Like, how many shows have we done where it's Shane Pinto's contract? Shane Pinto's contract. They get the one-year deal, obviously outside circumstances push that to january but we thought hey they had the little top drawer five-year deal six-year deal maybe a bridge deal but how have they had this much time to negotiate last summer and now through the end of january when because he signed in january he could have just signed an extension right away and still nothing now i believe it was bruce garriock recently pilsy that said that they're not even close from the standpoint that shane pinto asking for upwards of five ish million dollars on a long-term deal. We don't have the exact numbers and the sends of button down the hatchets. They're not getting uh, as many numbers out with the Mark Stone. We knew down to like the dollar figure, what was being offered. But with Shane Pinto, he's probably looking around and saying, all my boys got paid. Where's my bag? He comes back in the lineup. He produces, has a good points percentage. He's a valuable member of the team at both ends of the ice. I just think there's got to be some middle ground somewhere. Yeah, you would think, Ross. And, and like like you mentioned, they, they've been having these discussions for God knows how long. And I think at this point, though, Ross, we're looking at a situation where Shane Pinto and his agent and his team have all these numbers, all these stats to back up why Shane Pinto was so important to the Sens. And the Sens are probably going, yeah, we hear you, but you're an RFA. We have the hammer here. We have the leverage. If you want to play stiff, uh, stiff arm, and you're saying, look, we expect this much mo- amount of money for this amount of time, and we're not budging, the Sens can say, we'll wait. And I think maybe that's what we have, uh, a good old game of chicken. No one likes a game of chicken like uh, like I do, but this game of chicken, it might be... It might have long-lasting effects, especially a guy like Shane Pinto that is, like you said, a vibes guy. The vibes may be down if uh, he's not able to come to a deal that he feels happy with. And if that is the case, you know he's not going to go long-term, which for my bridge deal argument, I don't mind. But I think if if Pinto isn't happy, he might just be like, okay, we're just going to do a one-year deal and we're going to bring this back later. 
because you know he wants to be here for a while. He made it clear. He said he loves the boys. He loves the community. He wants to be here for a while. And if he's not able to get that price point that he wants, then I think he's just going to say, all right, until the leverage swings from the Sens back to him, he's not going to agree to something that the Senators want. At least that's that's the kind of, that's the framing I'm getting of this scenario. Let's do a little role play. You're Shane Pinto's agent. I'm Steve Steos. How are you selling me that Shane Pinto deserves upwards of $5 million? Name the number, whatever it is. Why does he deserve to make what is being thrown at the Senators as an offer? Well, the big thing I would say if I'm Shane Pinto's agent is, look, the Ottawa Senators might need me more than any other 31 teams in this league because they've got a top six center in Josh Norris that unfortunately can't be relied upon. And this is now two times that Shane Pinto has had to be elevated in the lineup to play that second line center. And Pinto can put up the points. Now, is he at a spot where a playoff contending Ottawa Senators team is comfortable with him as a second line center? Maybe not with the way the roster is constructed right now, but that's not Pinto's problem. He's going to say, look, I can be a dominant third line center or if and when Norris gets injured, I can be elevated into the lineup and be a sufficient second line center for the time being. And if you give me a long-term deal, by the time we're three, four, five years into that deal, I'm I'm thinking I'm ready to be a second line center and I better be getting paid as such. So that's where I would go if I was Pinto's agent. Does the second line center score nine goals a year? In how many games? Why did he only play that many games? That's that was a that's Steve Steos dropping the hammer. What he missed half the season. His leverage is not only as an RFA, but as an RFA that played 41 games. And by that time, the team was so far out of it that it was already meaningless games. And Shane Pinto, we've yeah, been very sure. heavily on his side. And I hope he gets paid. And I hope he's a senator for a long time. I got his goddamn Nodak jersey hanging in my closet. But if I'm the senators, I'm saying we expect a higher level from you. And I know it was a mistake clearly. And it was, it was not anything that was malicious, anything like that. The reason for the suspension, but you got some, you got some community service to do. And yeah, maybe you did that with the, the, the minimum deal for half the season, but I don't think that you should be jumping from seven seventy five to 5 million based on 27 points in 41 games. I understand Pinto deserving more than what he's getting, but I I understand the Sens side here where it's like, hey, we're not giving out coupons like the last regime. Hey, here's your seven mil. Here's your seven mil. Hey, we'll give you 4.95. We'll say it's under 5 million. We're not doing that anymore. The value is what it is and take it or leave it. That's where I'm concerned though, because if there's not a contract done by the time, not by the draft, but by the time that Steos and the Senators brass goes to Vegas. So the award shows Thursday, I guess they get in Tuesday or Wednesday. That's when the chatter is going to pick up between teams. Hey, why isn't Pinto signed? Hey, sharks are piranhas are swirling. You don't think Boston wants Shane Pinto in their lineup. I could name 15 other teams that would want him in their lineup. And that would probably give you a pretty decent return. Name another right shot centerman that the Sens have Mark Kastelik. Ha ha ha. The Sens need Shane Pinto. And, the, and Pinto doesn't have much leverage to say, I don't need them. And clearly he's shown he wants to be there. I just hope they can get something done. I was on team long-term and obviously I still wanted him to be a Senator for a long time, but Pilsy, I'm of the mind now where like, look, if we can't agree on a number on a long-term deal, I'm not doing one year. Cause we are just there not doing one year, two or three years, make it under $4 million. And I think it's probably a fair deal by the end of it. And Ross, that's a big reason why I've been pushing for this bridge deal, because I think logistically it's the only way these two sides are going to be able to come together and find a number that works. Because if you go long term, you essentially need to be paying him second line center insurance. If you go right. short term, then you can say, hey, for the next two to three years. We've got you in pen as a third line center that can be elevated in the lineup with room to grow. Let's get a bridge deal done. Then when you have one year left as an RFA, we're going to work on a long-term contract to make you a senator for the prime of your career. I just think that's the best scenario for both sides. Let us know in the comments. Shane Pinto, you got an updated thought? What is going on in your head when it comes to Shane Pinto's short and long-term future? 
with the Ottawa Senators. It's a fascinating conversation, Pilsy, because what pro- what players have the potential that Shane Pinto has, have shown it in over 100 NHL games, 140 now, 70 points. He's a half point per game player and obviously has been improving, but then he missed all but five games in a season due to his own injury and then missed half a season due to a suspension. So it's like, it's like, it's almost, and he burned a year off his entry level when he signed. Mm-hmm. Like that's three unfulfilled years of the four that he's played. So I'm curious to see what's next for Shane Pinto, but hopefully it's in Ottawa. Hopefully it's in a two, three kind of top nine role where he can really drive a line and be a contributing member. So I take a deep breath now. And I say that 48 hours after the Stanley cup final, the senators will give him his qualifying offer. And then the negotiation can really dig in to what the next deal will look like. Pilsy tee us up for some draft profiles because we got three entertaining players coming up. Ross, the, this trio of players might have the most offensive talent combined of any trio we've done. Like even, even one of these guys is probably the most offensively gifted players we've had. I'll let you decide which one. Who are they? Find out next. You're listening to Locked On Senators, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel is the official online sportsbook of the Locked On Senators podcast. And we love them because they're North America's number one sportsbook. It's playoff time, conference finals in the NBA and NHL, baseball, MLB is in full swing in the regular season, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. That's guaranteed, folks. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on everything, from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, simple, secure, easy to use. If I can use the FanDuel app, so can you, and it is the only sportsbook app that I turn to. If you want to bet on props, like player shots, totals, over-unders, you think it's going to be a high-scoring game. If you want to bet, you can even bet uh, rebound, assist props in basketball. You can have parlays, get some future bets in. you got to have a diverse portfolio on your FanDuel account, and you can do it today. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic W. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Glebe Central Pub, located right in the heart of the Glebe at 779 Bank Street. The Glebe Central Pub is your place to go when you want to have a great time. Whether it's Tuesday night trivia or whether it's wing night on Monday, still full full from last night, 75 cent per wing, minimum 10 per order. My goodness, you're going to eat 10. Like they say minimum 10, you're going to eat 10 wings at least at the Glebe Central Pub. Now, the Glebe Central Pub is also conveniently located, but that's just a bonus. What's great is the atmosphere inside. I'm talking about from the top down. Blair is always, what a bombastic personality our guy Blair is. He comes in guns blazing, having a great time at the bar, and he also makes sure that everyone around him is having fun too. Also, I had the smash burger last time I was at the Glebe Central Pub delicious so i would highly recommend the house smash burger get everything on it the burger sauce delicious i get the side caesar trying to watch my figure beach season coming up but the fries are awesome too you can't have a bad meal at the glebe central pub the vibes are free at the gcp go follow them on social media as well they show all their greatest events that are coming up at the glebe central pub live music every saturday you just know if it's saturday night if it's 9 p.m you want to get in the groove live music at the Glebe Central Pub. So go check them out at 779 Bank Street. Let them know that your friends at Locked On Senators sent you. It's the GCP, where the vibes are free at 779 Bank Street. All right, welcome back, Locked On Senators. A reminder, you can follow the show on social media, at Send Central on Twitter, LockedOn.Senators on Instagram, and we are posting all 80 of these individual draft profiles on our YouTube. So be a friend, tell a friend, their team drafts somebody. You know you get the pre-draft analysis right here on Locked On Senators. 
Coming in at number 44 on our 2024 Locked On Senators NHL Draft Rankings is a rare case. A Russian in the USHL, Matvey Gridden, is just dominant. 83 points, Pilsy. This guy led the entire league in points. Yeah, he really showed out in the USHL this season. I mean, anytime you can lead a league in points, you know you're having yourself a good season. And Gridden is able to do this, Ross, because he's a dual threat here. He's able to pass. He's able to shoot. He keeps goalies guessing, and he's racking up the points. In 60 games, he had 38 goals and 45 assists. He also had five points in eight playoff games. And... He will be attending University of Michigan next season. So he's on a great path. He's on a great path. And not only that, but he's the type of player that when I pulled up his um, his highlight reel on YouTube, I was like, man, this guy's fun. Like he makes hockey so much fun and exciting in the offensive zone. He challenges guys one-on-one. He's like, you can't get the puck for me. And boom, he makes two, three moves and it's still right on his teammate's stick. He can score, but I would argue he's as good of a playmaker as he is a scorer. And when you have 38 goals, that makes it pretty impressive. Yeah, he's very impressive. And uh, you talk about him being a fun player. If you're watching on YouTube, is he on the ice with a cowboy hat on? This guy is having a good time uh, in Muskegon in the USHL. And he teammate, actually teammate oh, of our ahead. guy, Philip Nordberg, this past season. Yeah, when I was watching highlights, I saw Nordberg uh, in there as well. So you love to see that. And Ross, he comes from a family of athletes. His dad was actually an Olympic skier, a hockey coach, and I believe he's a personal trainer now. So this guy clearly has um, athletic tendencies in his family. And one thing I like to do, Ross, uh, I'm going to have this an exercise for all USHL players. You look at uh, Gridden, and sure, he led the entire league in points. But I was curious. I was like, I wonder how he did against the top echelon of competition, the USNTDP. So I went through his game logs, Ross, and I looked at all the points he collected up against the top team in the league. He had 14 points in seven games against the program. Two point per game pace up against the top players in the country, at least as far as the USHL goes. So pretty impressive for Gridden there. It's not only impressive what he's done coming over from Russia to North America, but also what his potential could behold. He's six foot one, 182 pounds, classic Russian left wing, right shot, opening up that one timer, those offensive instincts take over from there. For the draft rankings, Bob McKenzie is second highest on him at 29, which means the NHL world, they've taken notice of what Gridden's been able to do. He's got, we've got Chris Peters at 26, Scott Wheeler down at 37, Corey Pronman at 39, Craig Button at 54, and then Elite Prospects at 58. So that's an average of 40.4 Pillsy. I'm going to go out on a limb here. First round talent, Matt V. Gridden. Somebody's going to take him in the first round. And I think he could, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself, but let's say two years at Michigan. And if it goes as planned, this guy might never even see the AHL. I don't think that's that crazy, Ross. I think you could be onto it here. Like there's so much to like about this kid. Um, like I mentioned, he's a dual threat. He's got creative passing. And then he's got a shot that's effective anywhere in the offensive zone. He likes to play close to the net and he can handle those battles in front. He's got a good toe drag wrister. He plays both sides of special teams, power play and the penalty kill. Now, one thing is he's a little inconsistent defensively. Uh, This guy clearly is an offensive player. I mean, he put up 83 points in 60 games. I don't need to emphasize that. It's very obvious there. And, He likes to cheat on offense. Uh, Even when he was on the penalty kill, Ross, I was watching highlights of him on the penalty kill. They haven't even cleared the puck, and it's a five-on-three in his own zone because he's already swerving around at center ice waiting for that dumped uh, uh, puck to come to him and create a chance. Now, when you're an offensive player like this, that's fine. He's backing it up. He's not like your buddy in beer league that just hangs at the blue line. Then when he doesn't get the puck goes for a change because he's back checking and he's getting in shot lanes to block shots. So he's one of those offensive players that 
if it doesn't seem like there's a chance for him to get the puck or for him to have a break, he kind of seems disinterested. But if he's in the mix and close enough to the puck, he's like, ooh, I want that puck. I'll do whatever it takes to get it. But if it's too far away, he's like, eh, someone else will get it and pass it to me. So that's one of those things that maybe Gritton, as he gets to higher competition levels, coaches are going to say, hey, we know you got it offensively. So let's take a work on playing a little harder on the defensive side of the puck too. Spin zone. He's out there killing penalties. And that means a coach has to trust him to a certain extent. And I think with Gridden, you're just wanting to get that extra stride of explosiveness, I think would be the next step for him. Like he's fast. He's fast enough. But to me, it's like you you like challenging guys one-on-one. Imagine you get an extra step. So if I'm if I'm his trainer this summer, and if you said he's coming from a family of strength and conditioning coaches, he's going to be using those fat twitch muscles and uh, making sure that he's coming in guns blazing next year imagine him as a winger on Rucker McGrory's line next year at Michigan the opportunities are endless and one team is going to be very happy that Matt Vay Gridden is theirs following the NHL draft in Las Vegas now as a senator's perspective Pilsy where is Gridden for you how many out of five stars Ross I see big offensive potential here I'm not so sure I'd take him at number 25, but I love him at number 39. I got four stars for Matt Faye Gridden here. I think if he's available in the second round, Ross, you might even see teams trade up to snag him, like leading the USHL in points, decent size to him, dual threat, plays both sides of special teams. Like there is a lot to like about this kid. And with a little bit more coaching and time, I think he can fix uh, some of the defensive inconsistencies. This is a great player, in my opinion. He is my top-ranked player, even after all of today's three profiles. He's at 43 with the potential, or sorry, 42 with the potential to even rise a little bit higher. I really am a fan of his game. He's a highlight reel, and he's the type of player that I think you can count on to play pro games and potentially be that middle six guy. Hey, even some PK time. Bills if he learns how to stay in his own zone during the penalty kill, but we know that he brings it on the power play as well. So Matt Vay Gridden comes in at number 44 on our locked on senators draft rankings. But as I mentioned right off the top, yeah, he'd be a great option for the Sens at 39, but I don't think he's making it past night one for more draft profiles. Go check us out on YouTube locked on senators. All right, Pilsy on the other side, we've got two more forwards to get to today a forward heavy day but man the offensive potential for all three of those guys is fun to think about what could come to the nhl on the other side you're listening to locked on senators your team every day A reminder, you can follow the show on social media. We're at Send Central on Twitter, LockedOn.Senators on Instagram. The show is free and available wherever you get your podcast. All right, coming in at number 43 on the Locked On Senators 2024 draft rankings, it's Maxime Massé out of Shikutimi in the QMJHL. He's a six foot two, 186 pound right winger that provides offense and, well, wasn't getting a whole lot of help with his teammates this season. Yeah, Masse did a lot of the heavy lifting as far as points are concerned with his team. He led his team in points, 75 points in 67 games. Nice, pretty even split here, Ross. 36 goals, 39 points. Now, I would describe him as a goal scorer that can make the right pass. I know uh, with um, Gridden, we called him a, a dual threat pass end shot. I would more say that Massey is a guy that if he's got the time and space to rip it, he's going to do that. But if he sees an opportunity to pass, he can make the right play too. So there's great uh, qualities of an offensive player right there. He's an assistant captain. He had six points in eight playoff games. He had five points in seven U18 games. And Ross, I know I listed off last season's stats for Maxime Massey, but we got to talk about the rookie season this kid had. I mean, he was well touted before he got to the queue as he was drafted third overall in the 2022 QMJHL draft. 
And he showed up right away. He was the Q rookie of the year with 62 points in 65 games. So normally you see guys get to their junior league and it's a little bit of a rocky start. Usually they're playing bottom six minutes. They're not able to rack up the points and they're struggling up against much older um, kids that have hit puberty a little bit quicker than them or at least are a couple of years ahead where that age gap from 16, 17 to some of the older players is such a big difference in size and strength. So they struggle, not Maxime Massey. He came into the queue and he was going right away. And maybe you're thinking, okay, you'd like a little bit more of a jump from year to year. He goes from 62 points to 75, but that's still showing enough consistent growth, in my opinion, that it doesn't really concern me. Well, the thing is, right, I'm looking at preseason draft rankings and mock drafts that have him in like 15 to 20 range, whereas oh, yeah. it just wasn't the same step up like we saw from Gridden, where he just exploded offensively. So it's that problem that scouts get where they've just seen the player for a number of years. And it's like the same old, same old, a bit like Shane Wright, yep, where he came definitely. into the Kingston. And then it's just like, okay, it's still a good prospect, but you want to see that year over year leap. Now he's an April birthday, about midway through the year of the hockey calendar. But I like the potential that he has there, but not in the first round. He's going to be a day two guy and early day two guy for me. And he is that for Bob McKenzie as well. 35th on Bob's list. 36 with McKean's, 39 with Peters, 44 with Button, 57 with EP. And oh, wow, Scott Wheeler has him as a first round talent, 27th on his list. He had 67 games with Shikatimi, and he was a minus four, but still put up 75 points. At the world under 18s, he impressed five points in six games there. Pilsy, send stars for Maxime Massé because I'm really curious. I want to jump right ahead to that because I. I'm a little bit lower on him. I think there's a bit of a boom or bust situation going on here with Massé, and I, I would probably bet on another horse, but I can see the upside of him too. So I'm curious where you have him. I've got him at four stars, Ross, here. I like a lot of the attributes that he has. Now, I don't think he's going to go in the second round. I've got my notes. I see him grow, uh, sorry, first round. I've got in my notes. I see him going early second round. Sens has decided to go with him at number 39. I wouldn't be that upset about it because this is the guy that from the highlights I saw, he drives his line. He plays a confident game. His teammates are constantly looking for him. And one thing, if you're going to be a goal scorer, you're not always going to get into soft ice and get those wristers from the top of the circle. This kid battles to get in front of the net, to be in, in those dirty areas. And if he's got a defenseman that's bigger than him, that's boxing him out. There might be guys that are stronger than him, but Maxime Massé is persistent, and he says, basically, you can cross-check me in the back all you want. The second that puck comes towards me, I'm going to get it before you, and I'm going to make you pay while you're working on being physical. I'll, I'll already have scored on you by the time you get your stick back on the ice or try to tie me up. So I like Maxime Massé a lot, and like I mentioned, at 39, I think that's the proper range for him. And looking at our guy, Scott Wheeler, since he has him the highest at 27, he just calls him above average skill across the board, whether it's his natural and versatile shot, whether it's uh, the completeness of his game that just stands out. He's going to penalty kill and be in the zone. He goes to dirty areas as well. Scott Wheeler really gets in depth in his write-up about why he believes Massey is a first-round talent. So just outside for me, I've got him around 50 on my board so far right in that range of the Max Plants and the Adam Yeckos of the world. So I'm curious to see because he could also be a guy with that talent, hopefully, that's coming in Chikatimi. Again, he led the team by 15 points this year and played one less game than the guy who was in second place. So I'd like to see him surrounded by a little more talent, and he could have 100 points next year in the queue. That wouldn't surprise me, but I just look at the NHL translatability, and there's just some other guys in this range that I see that one glowing attribute that just jumps out. Whereas for him, hey, it's good to be a complete player, especially at such a young age. But I think that scouts and maybe here as an outsider myself, I, I get excited about the the one-on-one -on -one skill of a grid and or a guy like, you know, that one-on-one -on -one potential that you can see from a player. So I've, I'm a little bit lower on Maxime Maxé, but if your team just selected him, you've got a guy who's who's got his toolbox full. He's a tradesman. 
And it's just about how he's going to use them to get him to be the best player that he can be. But he comes in at 43 on our Locked On Senators NHL draft rankings. That average rank of 39.7. Oh, it's awfully close to where the Senators pick at 39. For more draft profiles, go check us out. Locked On Senators. All right, coming in at number 42 on our Locked On Senators NHL draft rankings is Lucas Pedersen, an undersized but, oh man, skilled forward out of Sweden. He's been playing with Moto with their J20 league, but he also has gotten a taste of the SHL. And for me, for a guy who's standing 5'11", 168, I think it's pretty impressive that he's been able to make the jump even just for five games at the, the SHL's top league. Ross, Lucas Pedersen is not in the SHL because he's a bully. Lucas Pedersen was able to play a handful of games in the SHL because other guys just can't catch him. This is a fast two-way centerman, and the speed that he has is very impressive. Um, Scott Wheeler calls him a a two-way centerman that skates fast, good snapshot, and forces turnovers. Now, we mentioned... Five games in the SHL, unfortunately, zero points in those games. But let's get to where it really counts and where he made his uh, made his game shine in the anytime J20 point, League. Anytime point score in the J20 League, get your Lucas Pedersen tickets. Big time, yeah, because in 44 games, he had 57 points, 27 goals, 30 assists. It was clear that this guy dominated at the J20 level, and that's why he was able to go to the SHL. Um, He was also an assistant captain in the U18 games. He had eight points in seven games, so more than a point-per-game pace up against his peers. He is solid, and so much that they wanted to. Moto wanted to squeeze a little extra hockey out of him. At the end of the season, he went back down to J18 level, where... In three games, Ross, you guessed it, three points. Like when this guy's up against his peers, he makes it look easy. Lucas Pedersen is on Chris Peters' board, the highest of our seven entities at 30. He's actually not even ranked by Corey Pronman. That's a, a bit of a head scratcher. Bob McKenzie at 31. Scott Wheeler at 36. McKean's at 37. Elite Prospects at 44. Craig Button bringing up the rear at 50. Three. The points jump out, but it's also a responsible game for Lucas Pedersen. And that's what I think is going to attract scouts to him where it's like, oh man, look at the offensive potential down against his peers. Well, let's see what he's going to project to be at the next level. Is he going to be an Elias Lindholm? Like, could, could he be that type of two-way guy who can score 50 points? I'm not so sure. But heck, every time he's out there against his peers, he produces at the world under 18s eight points in seven games. So who's to say when he's 27 in his prime that he's not going to be at the top against his peers because he's shown it time and time again that he can. So I don't want to bet against this horse. I actually really like him. I'm, I'm almost thinking of, of rising him up right now. I had him just one spot below Julius Mietnin, but like, I'm thinking of moving him all the way up to like Teddy Stiga territory. Like he's going to be up there with my top forwards in the second round. It feels like, And he could be a guy, especially a team with strong Swedish ties. You think Detroit right off top of your head, like that would be a perfect landing spot for a guy like Lucas Patterson. Yeah. And I wouldn't doubt if Detroit's got, uh, got some eyes on him already. Like you mentioned, they've got a lot of Swedish talent over there, especially in their prospect pipeline. And we've talked a lot about the offense Ross, but this is a guy that kills penalties as well. And I feel like he's one of those guys on the penalty kill. It's so nice to have a burner on your PK, right? If uh, the defensemen on the power play, your opponent's power play are a little lackadaisical and they're, they're playing give and go on the blue line. Well, look out Lucas Pedersen's going to jump in there, steal it and he's gone and he gets an offensive opportunity down a man before you know it. So I really think there is a lot of talent here. Like you said, I bet like whichever team drafts him by the time his entry level deal is up, I bet he's going to be up to speed in the NHL. It just seems like this is a guy that when he has time to get comfortable, he ends up thriving. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Lucas Pedersen does next season. I got to assume he's going to spend 
majority, if not all, his time in the SHL. Like, what more does this guy have to prove in the J20 League? So next season will be a big one for his development. It certainly will. And with Patterson, he wore a C for the J18 team when he was younger and was an alternate captain for both the J20 team at Moto this year, as well as the Swedish under 18 team in that tournament at the end of the season. So clearly he's got leadership qualities. He's competitive. He works. He's the type of guy who I think the offense is so good against his peers that you always kind of just like expect it to be like the offensive driven player, but man, he's a well-rounded player. I'm talking myself into it, man. I would, I would love if the senators took him at 39 pills. How many send stars do you have? So I've got him at three and a half stars here. Uh, Again, that's not because I don't like the player. Uh, I don't know, Ross. I I think for me, I just, I don't know where he fits in the Sens system. And I feel like there's other opportunities and other types of prospects that they could go for. Again, it's not a knock on Lucas Pedersen. I also think I've, I've got this guy in the 28 to like 33 range. Like I know that's kind of random and I'm not sure how I came up with that, but I just feel like he's going to go to a contending team at the end of the first round or a rebuilding team at the start of the second round that wants to take an opportunity to draft a guy that's been dominating amongst his peers. So I don't think he's going to make it to either part of one of those uh, sends picks at the end of the first round. I think it'd be a bit of a reach at the first round. And then I don't think he's going to make it to 39. So that's why I got him at three and a half. I'll call my shot. I'm going to say the New York Rangers in James Dolan sphere are going to walk up there with the 32nd pick. Yep. Yep. I'm calling it on May 27th. They're winning the cup and he's going to come out there and say from Modo in the Swedish league. That's supposed to be Dion Solberg's spot. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's going to be Lucas Patterson. Solberg's right up there. I still have Solberg uh, three spots up on that. Solberg's second on my list, but we won't get too deep into that. We'll point you to all of our draft profiles that we've got on Locked On Senators YouTube channel. All right, that's been another edition of the Locked On Senators podcast. Thank you so much for watching, listening, engaging with the show. Looking forward to another episode coming down the pipeline What more rumors are going to unsubstantiately come onto the timeline over the next couple of days? Better not be any more BS, Ross. No, we're done with the BS. But we will say goodbye for today. Thanks so much for watching. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been another edition of the Locked On Senators Podcast. Your team, every day.